All those who are holding tickets outside will get in as fast as they can. I'm speaking out to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to the crowd on the outside who seem to be standing rather reluctant to come in, and we're going to start this very soon. Welcome back to Worthy. My name is John. And I'm Ben. And today we are joined by a very special guest. Last time she was on the podcast was just about a year ago for our Worthy Summer Review of 2022. Previously, she was my girlfriend, Jacqueline. She is now my fiance. Hello, audience. This is Jacqueline, a.k.a. Jackie. Um, great to be here with Ben and my fiance. <laughs> fiance. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, I am her fiance. That's right. You heard that. So today we're talking about the summer of 2023, and we're going to dive deep. We're going to talk about the top 10 of the box office and some of the big popular news stories of the summer. So I'm going to jump in by talking a little bit about this past summer. The Atomic Bomb, Spider-Man, and Millennial Pink rule the summer box office, but is this enough to keep theaters afloat another year? Strikes and greedy CEOs fuel the ever-changing landscape of Hollywood and the motion picture business as writing and actor strikes pushes past three months with no end in sight. With pushbacks and indefinite delays on the horizon, did the summer box office make for what looks to be a lackluster fall movie season? Well, only time will tell, Ben and Jackie. So how this works is that we're going to break down the box office top 10, and that is domestic summer box office. So only films in the box office of the United States currency, the USD, and this starts from May all the way to Labor Day. So we just wrapped up what they define as the summer box office, and we're going to start out with number 10, which is Pixar's Elemental, released on June 16th by Disney with a total of $153 million. So Pixar's Elemental is an interesting film on the list because it's known as a sleeper hit. This film originally came out and it only made $29.5 million on its opening weekend. And it seemed to struggle. Immediately, I think the news and and the kind of press determined this as a flop. It determined it as something that didn't really work out. It's another bomb for Pixar. And I think there's a lot of reasons why they may be struggling. But what we saw week after week after week is that people kept going. There was word of mouth. There was a lot of people that continued to tell people and inspire other people to go out and see it. And Jack and I got to take some time last night and kind of watch Elemental. And we have some thoughts. First, I'll give my little mini review. I thought Elemental was adorable. It's essentially a love story between these two different elements, fire and water. And it's basically about you know, uniting. You may have differences. There may be, you know, vast differences between the way you're raised, who you are, what you like, but you can still come together and learn and grow together. But Jackie, what did you think of Pixar's Elemental? I liked it. I thought it was cute. Um, It felt like a story I had seen before. I can't put my thumb on exactly what that story is. It just felt pretty typical of Pixar, Um, but it was cute. And especially if you have kids, it felt like a good um, reason to get out of the house and go to the theaters and support um, a a cute little movie. I thought it was fun to watch. Ben, did you see it? I did not uh, see Elemental when it came out this summer, but it, I think the thing with Pixar is that you can just approach it anytime. Like we all have a Disney plus account. Well, most people I'm assuming have a Disney plus account and it's pretty accessible. So uh, definitely on my list to go see it, Um, but still did, you know, pretty well, like worldwide uh, with what it brought in, like typical, you know, Pixar getting all that money. So I'm definitely excited to give it a watch. I'm glad you two liked it. Yeah. I thought it was really cute. I think really the biggest issue for me is kind of, the plot is centered around such a pivotal love story, and I honestly can't think of another Pixar film that is like just straightforward. This is a love story. This is a romantic comedy, basically. And while I kind of love that, it's new and interesting, it, it felt like hard to emotionally connect on a love story when your main character is literally a flame. And I know that sounds insane. It's called Elemental, but it's just a little hard to like humanly connect with a blob of water and fire. It was just like a barrier I just like couldn't cross. But I do have to say that the animation in this movie is unreal. It's some of the best looking like water effects and VFX that I've ever seen. It is really, really beautiful when it comes to the animation. Alrighty, moving on to number nine, we have Transformers. 
Skull and Rise of the Beast, which came out on June 9th from Paramount and made $157 million. This is the fourth highest grossing film in the Transformers franchise. Ben, did you get a chance to see Transformers Rise of the Beast? Um, I'm good. Yeah, same. I'm good on that. <laughs> Miss me with that one. You know, there is beasts in this movie i saw a robotic gorilla that looked pretty sweet no none of us saw this movie so we don't have much to say although it's interesting because i did hear spoiler i don't i don't think this is going to break anyone's hearts wait can i guess uh, if you haven't can, seen can it i guess well i'll tell you first there's a something that happens at the very end that basically cues us up for the next movie or next possible multiple films and can you guess what that might be is that like Transformers versus like was that um not Animorphs the 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 <laughs> be- beast whatever you, you know what I'm talking about <laughs> I I'm assuming that's kind of what the movie is itself it looks like there's like robotic transformer animals but no the movie supposedly ends with our main character basically being recruited into GI Joe oh, as if there's going to be a GI what? Joe Transformers crossover <laughs> what <laughs> what is that so that's not a thing if that happens that's pretty amazing. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to another huge franchise, which is Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 came out on July 12th from Paramount and made $170 million domestically. This, unfortunately, is the second worst performing Mission Impossible behind the third film from 2006 directed by J.J. Abrams. And even more unfortunate is that the last film... Mission Impossible Fallout was the highest grossing film of all time. So this is a really, really interesting one here because it is top eight. And, you know, it's it's an honor to make the list at all to even get on the top 10 highest grossing films of summer. But you would expect after last year's Top Gun with Tom Cruise that this would be a huge movie, that this would blow up and possibly be the second or even number one highest grossing film of the summer. But something happened here. No one seemed to go out and and really care. I didn't hear that many people talking about it. Me, personally, I had a great time seeing Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I thought it was a fun time at the movies. It really did what Mission Impossible does best and is make these big climactic moments, these big set pieces. And you constantly are, we're on the edge of your seat and I can't wait for the second part. So, Ben... Did you get a chance to watch Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning or, or what are your yeah. thoughts there? Yeah, no, I got to see this one. I was, very, I was very excited to go see it. I, and I had the same feeling of that. Oh, well, the, you know, the wave of Tom Cruise from last year, Top Gun, like that's totally going to carry, you know, a ton of momentum. And Mission Impossible is going to be a huge, you know, summer hit. And, and to see it 170 million, like that's, you know, not like it's, it's no money, but that's it's pretty shocking. And, and And I don't know the reason exactly why i mean i'm not a huge i wasn't a huge fan of the movie by the end of it because i felt that what a lot of it was trying to accomplish did not need to be just one movie i they didn't need to make it two two parts and maybe that's the thought of that well people are like oh i have to watch two parts of this story maybe i'll just invest my time into the second part um and when that comes out then i'll watch the first one because there's because it does still fit that and I hate to say a cookie cutter, but kind of like that formula of Mission Impossible movies still. So maybe people don't feel the need to just like go out and see it. Um, and honestly, when I when I look at the date also, like July 12th, only like what, 10 days later was the whole Barbenheimer thing. And I would, I'm trying to remember, like probably 10 days out was a huge kind of like wave of like Bar- Barbenheimer and people getting like hyped up for it that maybe people were resisting going to the movies because they were waiting for like that experience yeah i was just thinking i was looking at the date too and i feel like it kind of there was probably initial hype there that just kind of got buried because of barbenheimer people weren't going out to see mission impossible there now you know got two way bigger box office hits to go see so um people probably missed out on this one though i had a lot of fun watching it um i thought it was great john suggested we go see it in 4dx (laughs) Um, And I told him, definitely not. I did not want to lose my lunch um, while strapped in and getting squirted with water and, you know, punched in the back while watching this film in 4DX. But um, it was still a great time. And I'm I'm glad we saw it. It was a fun watch. I I saw it in Dolby and I definitely felt like my back being kicked by the sound, especially at the end during the train sequence. Like that was every time I would like thought it was like, 
bang <laughs> every single time like to your the back of your seat um but yeah it was, it was a good watch i definitely I, I enjoyed it but i also was like i did fall into that whole okay this movie's two hours and 45 minutes maybe we could have made just just like a two hour movie that was pretty quick to get us to that next part yeah it almost felt like this didn't need to be part one i think you really hit the nail on the head with barbenheimer kind of right on the edges of it i tom cruise even asked and, and got extra imax screens because they were being taken up by oppenheimer and i think that helped push it a little bit further up the box office but still you know, it's a really interesting one because it's like what what am I missing? Because you could look at another film later on our list here that is a part one, and it could be related to maybe the marketing. Maybe the marketing doesn't, the title isn't a part one, so maybe it's just using a better kind of title, something that is more indicative of just a single story in a single film. So we'll see. I think also you could look at some of the marketing of Mission Impossible, and while they market the stunts, they know what people really want to see in these films. When you watch the trailers for Dead Reckoning Part 1, you don't really get a sense of what the movie is about. You say, like, okay, Tom Cruise, he's got to save the day. He's got to do something else. Like, we get that. So what else is there? You know, when you watch the trailer, I had no idea that the villain of the movie was AI. And maybe they kept that a secret because that is really on the nose of a hot topic these days and a lot of people are talking about that or is it just they wanted to fuel and push towards those stunts of what people think mission impossible is yeah and it's it's funny you say that because the ai thing was interesting for the timing and then also do you remember the whole submarine thing that was going on at that time yes, at like what, time, when that yeah. first scene is about the submarine and, and then being trapped down there and you have to look for it it was just like this is too eerie how it just matches up like that um so i just i just wanted to give that a little bit of a shout out because they the writers i guess nailed it on the head with uh topical things that that they knew would be happening at this time i guess (laughs) yeah really freaky how that works out but let's move on to our number seven here of the summer which is indiana jones and the dial of destiny so this is our last indiana jones film and while this movie did make $174 million and was released on June 30th by Disney, it is reported that this will be a $100-plus million dollar loss. So again, another question here. It doesn't conflict with too many other dates, but it really makes me ask the question of why or what happened here. What is wrong with the Indiana Jones franchise? Is he just too old? Do people not want to see this old man anymore? Do people not care about Indiana Jones as a franchise anymore? What do you think it is, Ben? The movie was just poopy, John. I like, and I, I really don't have a better. I know. I see you shaking your head. I know you really did like it, but I, I could not get behind it. I thought it was just the most obvious, like executive money grab thing. That let's just do another Indiana Jones movie. Let's throw all the money at it. Let's throw all this like excessive marketing at it, and. It they didn't care about the quality of it, and I I just I really didn't find it to be that good of a movie. It honestly made Kingdom uh, with the Crystal Skull, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, like a better movie. I didn't see this one, and I know John's gonna heavily disagree with me on this, especially because I haven't seen it. But I work with kids, and I feel like because of that, I have a pretty good uh, feel for like what kids like and what people like to see in general. The youths, as they say, and like I had students talking about the Transformers movie not a single one of my students mentioned Indiana Jones they never ever bring up Indiana Jones as like you know a a movie series that they like nobody the youths don't care about Indiana Jones anymore I'm so sorry to break your heart there John yeah and I think one of the other faults too and this is where trailers can really mess it up and it's same thing with Mission Impossible like Mission Impossible showed the best stunts at the beginning and Indiana Jones just was like, you know, it showed off the like really weird, glitchy de-aging stuff. Like right off the bat, it, you know, introduced you the story, you know, got introduced you, you're like, what is this? Is this time travel? Are they, are, you know, like they couldn't, it was really hard to put together. And I feel like just like poor trailer making, like is also a downfall of these movies as well. It's just like, they didn't clearly tell you what it's about or they showed too much. That's really interesting because that I think I totally agree with that point. And I agree that, you know, I don't think people care about this franchise and it's mainly people that are like 
40 and up and then there's like some cinephiles here and there like me and you who just love indiana jones as like a character and these beautiful adventure films that are just so iconic and have continued to inspire films even 50 years later and that's really apparent but yeah it's just not a recognizable character for the youth i mean i don't know how it would be because it's it's so distant from what we think of now when we think of action heroes and action films I do, however, disagree with you that I I really enjoyed this movie, actually, and I love Indiana Jones. I think this is a much, much better film than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and I don't think it's a perfect movie. You know, I don't think this is amazing. I think there's things like the de-aging that I didn't think was necessary. I thought it was, like, visually very weird at times. It looked amazing. At times, it looked horrible. At times, like, like, I didn't really notice, so it just wasn't perfect so then it immediately goes to a flaw and i think people can point at that but the the whole reaction to this movie was so interesting because people were like they de-aged him and it looked crappy and that's why this movie sucks because they all they care about is money and then there's other people who are like the de-aged part with the young indiana jones was the best part of the movie and like everyone has the complete opposite opinion when it comes to this movie there's no one in the middle who was just like it was okay everyone's just like this was horrible or this was the best Indiana Jones film that we've seen in years. And I, I truly think I'm kind of in the middle. I was like, that was a really nice way to end his character. I thought kingdom of the crystal skull was so offensive in a lot of the ways that they like overused CGI and the whole look of that movie just does not match the end of Jones, Indiana Jones franchise for me at all. And I thought this film, it brought us back to that great look. I thought a lot of the action scenes were really intense and engaging and super interesting. And, It is a hard task to take a character who's so old and make an action film out of it. And I think they did a great job of taking this like Yelena character and and giving her enough screen time to kind of balance that and provide more action to it. But it's messy. I I don't like the de-aging. I don't think that was necessary, but I understand why they thought it was necessary because without that, there is no like huge Marvel-esque like big action scene And I get why you may look at the film and be like, well, this is just like an old man who hates the world movie. Like, this is not fun. And I get that. I also get that argument. So it's it's really tough. I I think one of, and I remember looking it up, but the movie, and I hate the whole like time thing because I'm I'm a big like let movies just breathe and be their own thing. But this movie is, you know, it's almost two and a half hours. And then Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is the best of the franchise, is one of the, you know, well-crafted fun adventure action movies with like big stars and that movie was like an hour and 45 minutes and i think it's like that that's an indiana jones movie where it's just straight action there's something you know the emotional core isn't as important as the big set piece the big trap that he's trying to get out of the the animal or, or the or the people that are going after him he's trying to get away from like that's like indiana jones not you know, a sad old Harrison Ford talking about like his life and what he wished he could have done. And, you know, there's been a ton of movies like that. Like, why does Indiana Jones need to have that kind of crisis? Why can't Indiana Jones just be the cool old man that just like whips and just swings around? And like, that's just the fun hour and a half hour, 40 minute adventure. Yeah. I, it's interesting. I think that could have maybe been done. Maybe it's someone who just refuses to acknowledge that they're old and that it's a very different way of taking that character and like approaching them like the opposite basically but at the same time i kind of get the just i'm an old man like i'm too old for this shit i mean that's just something that we've seen throughout cinematic history a lot and i kind of get that trope as well of how do we like re-inspire this character um and how do we get him to a point to be re-inspired so I I don't know I, I understand again both sides of it. You look like you want to continue. Well, yeah, talking well to you about because it. that is like my one. That was like the big like number one thing I came out of this movie criticizing it is that he the big ending where and spoilers they time travel you know back in time and then he's like no I want to stay in what ancient Rome whenever whatever was going on and then he just gets knocked out. And then brought back to the same time. So it's not like he made any decisions. He wanted to just stay and die. But unfortunately, he got saved. And then, you know, that leads to the ending where, like, he's reunited with his ex-wife. So it's like, I don't see the growth in that. Like, And, and that's, like, my criticism of it is, like, you didn't actually give Indiana Jones the agency to decide. You actually 
took away his wishes of like, and maybe that's the perfect ending for Indiana Jones is that he dies in history. He dies what he loves. And maybe that was the original ending. You you definitely say you see studio interference. I think that's totally possible. Yeah, maybe. Because Disney is, is a total mess. And it's, it's just films that like are hugely successful or they're just extremely just absolutely shit on and, and disrespected and for good reason, I think. And a lot of people just didn't show up to the box office. But one of the weirdest, most interesting aspects of the top 10 here is our number six, which is an indie film called Sound of Freedom, which came out on July 4th from Angel Studios and made $181 million. The Sound of Freedom is actually the highest grossing indie film since 2019's Best Picture winner, Parasite. And I found this this specific film so interesting in terms of how it got to this point and its box office success that I wanted to talk a little bit about this and tell this little quote here from Time Magazine from Megan McCluskey, which says, Build as a story about the real-life Tim Ballard, a former special agent from the Department of Homeland Security and a founder of the anti-trafficking group Operation Underground Railroad, Sound of Freedom has become mirrored in controversy over criticisms that it features misleading depictions of child exploitation and plays into right-wing conspiracy theories associated with QAnon movements. These associations have been perpetrated by both Ballard and his on-screen counterpart, Jim Caviezel, who has been a prominent supporter of QAnon for years. The film's distributor, Angel Studios, has denied that Sound of Freedom is political or connected to QAnon. Quote, Anybody who watches this film knows that this film is not about conspiracy theories, end quote. Angel CEO Neil Harmon said in an interview, quote, it's not about politics, end quote. So this film comes out of nowhere. No one really knows that much about it. It had this weird program that they were pushing called a pay it forward marketing campaign. So what this pay it forward campaign would do is you would allow yourself to buy a ticket and send it to someone, basically. And if that already sounds very suspicious and questionable, I think you totally have a reason to think that. To me, we have this weird grassroots campaign that pushed ticket sales. And yes, I do think that there are a lot of people that agree with these guys' takes. There may be QAnon, there may be whatever you have to say, whatever you identify, it doesn't even matter. What does matter is that they've somehow fueled this community to go out and see a movie and a movie about (laughs) child exploitation and ending child trafficking. It is such a weird film to even be shown and listed on this top 10 because it's not a huge action film. It's not some famous iconic character that we can kind of look at and be like, yeah, it has a lot of fans. All you can really point to is this weird story of how they used a whole new marketing system of pay it forward and letting people buy tickets for people and maybe hoard huge organizations bought thousands of tickets. And it also brings up for me the question of, of ethics. I mean, I can't think of a film where you could buy tickets for other people. You can buy technically any ticket for other people if you want to, but this is like a planned marketing tactic in order to push this film forward. To me, I think that opens you up to a very sketchy ground where it's like, well, who is buying these tickets? Could like huge, like run companies just buy a hundred thousand tickets and it makes it look like the ticket sales for this movie are drastically bumped up is it people from the studio themselves buying thousands of tickets i think you have just such a huge can of worms that you open up that makes you question just the ethics of this kind of marketing but also maybe it is just a very interesting movie that hit this kind of specific beat of people and it really made them you know muster up this storm of popularity I don't know. All that being said, Ben, what do you think about The Sound of Freedom and this crazy journey it's been on? Uh, it's pretty bizarre. I mean, it, it's obvious, like, who's going to see this movie, like, without getting, like, political about it. So there's, you know, enough people to counterbalance the the donations, I guess we could call it, of... Uh, buying all those tickets and and getting that number up. I mean, internationally, the movie only made another $6 million, like on top of the, the domestic growth. So it's only just Americans going to see this movie for the most part. And there are people who have money out there who have certain political agendas and they're just, you know, skyrocketing it up. 
or maybe it's all a big sham. I don't know, but uh, it's definitely definitely fishy when it comes to the politics of it. Politics aside, um, I think it's interesting that this is the highest grossing indie film since Parasite. Um, why do you guys think that is? Why are indie films not performing better at the box office? Well, why they're not performing at the box office is just, a, I guess, the lack of marketing at like most of America, like really only New York and LA know about certain movies, certain, uh, or are into certain types of films that are aware of like underground films, indie films and filmmakers. So I think it's the, that the fact that, and you know, there's a lot of indie love, you know, in, you know, the, we have South by Southwest, you know, you know, there are these little like film festivals that pocket their pockets, like in middle America and the Midwest, but it doesn't necessarily, I think, translate to like an indie love that you get in New York and uh, and in L.A. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. It's so bizarre to me how much money this movie made when you look at last year's Best Picture winner and a movie that was talked about everywhere. I heard so many people talking about it. Everyone was talking about this movie all year, even way before the Oscar kind of season got to it. But everything everywhere all at once made $77 million domestically. The Sound of Freedom made over a hundred and ten million dollars more than that. It made more than double, like close to almost triple the amount of money. Like, who have you met in real life talking about Sound of Freedom? And you could say, yes, it's not your demographic. Maybe you're not in certain like people's groups that you're not hearing about this movie. But I haven't heard anybody talk about this movie. Not in real life. It's been all online chatter. I, I am not afraid to say that this I think this entire box office, there is some shenanigans happening here. There is something suspicious happening here. I don't know what is afoot here, but something is afoot. Look, when people are really into something, they'll make it known and make it happen. And I, I think you're right. Yeah. You're also right about that. To me, it's just shocking that not only this is like, the highest grossing independent film for three years, four years. It's the subject matter. Like this is an extremely dark movie about like saving children being sex sex trafficked. Like what is causing people to like need to go see this movie? Well, it's it's truly fascinating. Well, we did have a best picture winner in spotlight. That's about, you know, sexual and child abuse within the Catholic church. And everyone loved that. So Sure. You know, so sure. you're not wrong. Yeah. So there's definitely, uh, and we talk about it all the time. There's a weird appeal that people have to looking at horror, violence, just awful shit on screen because it like tickles their fancy a little bit. You know, because it's like, ooh, that gets, you know, my blood going. You know, in terms of like the heart racing and emotions heightened. So I'm not surprised the subject matter is that, um, but it's man it's just like a bunch of people just got you know a groundswell of people who got it to where it is and if what you're saying is like true about people buying like both tickets for you know people to watch like there are people with a lot of money out there that i would not be surprised they just gave it away to do this yeah i definitely saw a lot of reports and random people going into theaters that said they were sold out and there was no one there or maybe a couple people there, but the whole theater was sold out. Yeah. So there's definitely something suspicious about this. I think the overall question of why aren't indie films in the top 10 more often is a really interesting thing. And I think it definitely comes down to marketing. Like you said, these films don't have these massive budgets. They don't have this huge amount of money to spend and get in front of everybody. But I think when you look at this list here, you kind of see a trend. It's notable things. It's figures. It's characters. You know, from what we've gone so far down the list, our top 10, you know, Elemental is iconic for the studio. It's Pixar. That kind of stands on its own. Then you have Transformers. Then you have the brand and and uh, Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. You have Indiana Jones. He is a brand. He is a character. And then you get to Sound of Freedom. It's just like, what? Like, this is not a brand. This is not a character. This is not even an action film to sell on this, like, grand scale of these awesome set pieces or explosions. This is something so different. And I just don't think any indie 
really company has that level of access to brands and access to characters that opens an even bigger question of wow it would be so interesting if a24 was given the rights to make a dc film to make a marvel film to make a huge studio f- level film so it's not even you know it's funny to say 24 and you know we're saying the top 10 but if you expand the list to the top 20 and number 20 is talk to me you know a24's movie made 44 million dollars domestically over the summer so it yeah it's not 180 million dollars but for a small indie movie to make 44 million dollars and i'm sure year over year there are tons of indie movies that are in the top 20 30 in the top you know top 50 movies that are making so much money for what they originally started out with well let's talk about the little indie studio called walt disney studios and number five here on our box office worthy summer review is the little mermaid which came out on may 26th and made 298 million dollars now the budget of the little mermaid was actually 265 million so i think that immediately changes your perspective on how well this film did you know, while it grossed $298 million domestically, it made 263 internationally, it's hard to really call this movie a huge success. So that kind of leads me to ask the question about The Little Mermaid and about Disney live-action remakes, and that is, is this the end? Is this the marker? Is this the epilogue of the Disney live-action remakes in terms of them being this you know, box office smashed. Every film makes over a billion dollars. We're going to keep pumping these out until we die. Yeah. Um, I did not see the little mermaid. So I have like little to say about the little mermaid. Um, but in terms of the end of Disney live action remakes, I don't know. I, they're still going to try and do it. I just think that, you know, what's the next big thing they could possibly like remake is my question. What, Hercules is Hercules the next big thing they could do? Are they trying to do that? Um, like what other like Disney? Snow White. They're coming out with Snow White. Cinderella. Like there's there's options. It. No, didn't they do Cinderella? Not that I recall. See, they and did. like this is the thing I with the live action Disney movies is that yeah, in 2015, there is a Cinderella that came out. Yes. Um. Yeah, they've done it multiple times, and there is Snow White already on the way, which is already in controversy. They are already working on a Hercules movie as well. Yeah, so but like, there you go, but I think my point <laughs> is, is that those movies I feel like aren't marketed enough. Like, yeah, like I saw the trailer for the Little Mermaid, but now I think about it, there was not not much word of mouth when that movie was out and it was performing, and it's not in you know whether it's because people liked the movie or not, but also. It's Disney. You think that there would be some kind of hype and just I think these movies just really don't capture everybody's imaginations. I think everyone's comparing it too much to like the the animated versions of these stories. Like that's what people like. And so they're going to compare these blown up versions of it and say, well, that's just not, you know, it's, that's not my Little Mermaid. I know you put the not my Ariel hashtag, but that's kind of like me what people were thinking of just like this isn't the Little Mermaid I was anticipating from, that I watched as a child. I feel like it's hard not to compare to the animated versions because that's what the story that everyone knew growing up, that's what everybody, you know, fell in love with. The Little Mermaid was a movie that I used to watch on repeat growing up. Like, that was one of my favorites. Um, and I enjoyed it. However, being that the original was, you know... Um, shown in what is it 1989 the original little mermaid i would have expected that in 2023 there would have been some changes to the storyline i hate the um you know classic disney story of girl falls in love with boy after one um landing eyes on him and um, i just feel like that could have been changed adapted in some kind of way you know a little bit more feminism thrown in there sprinkled here and there would have been nice but um overall i thought it was good um hallie bailey is that how you say your name she did a fantastic job um i really liked melissa mccarthy as ursula i thought she killed it um she did a fantastic job singing too and um i really liked aquafina as the little crab scuttle um i thought that the three of them did a fantastic job um however i just feel like 
to keep interest. If you're going to be remaking these movies, I expect that there's a little bit more um, modern spins put on them. Yeah, funny enough, and how many people call this movie woke and just trash because it starred a black lead instead of a white lead as Little Mermaid, yet there are barely any changes made to the actual storyline, which could be looked at as extremely uh, just not very deep in terms of its female characters and how a female is represented, really. I mean, it's simply just about a classic Disney story of, you know, needing love, wanting love. And that's about it. She'll do anything. She'll sac- sacrifice so much for love. And I didn't really change mu- much at all. But I did like some of the changes. Like you mentioned, Aquafina who plays Scuttle the Seagull. You said crab. I'm, g- I'm just going to correct that. And I think it's Haley Bailey, which is just the Hallie Haley. Just so confusing. It gets me every freaking time. But I thought she was incredible in this movie. I really enjoyed her performance. The CGI was great at times, but also so interesting and scary i don't know there's just it's just we're not there i don't know if we'll ever be there at making these characters look real and i know it's a mermaid it's not supposed to be that real but there's some you can just tell that it's not her real hair it's just a floating head effect that's all i can describe it as that you can like feel this sense of unease and something is not right when you see a weird kind of floating head that's just not perfectly attaching to its face and it just looks something looks not right all the time but overall i thought the cgi was really interesting um i'm forgetting her name who played ursula but she was fantastic melissa mccarthy as ursula thank you my wonderful fiance but overall i thought it was enjoyable you know respectable i kind of understand where it landed here it still made a lot of money it just had such a crazy big budget, and what do you expect trying to make a movie like The Little Mermaid into a live action? Alrighty, moving on to our fourth highest grossing film domestically this year was Oppenheimer from Universal. It was released on July 21st and made $310 million. Christopher Nolan's dark historical epic, Oppenheimer has crossed another remarkable box office milestone with $850 million in global ticket sales, and there is a possibility that this film might go on to make a billion dollars. Now, this movie is very dark. It is a part of the Barbenheimer crazy, you know, frenzy that we kind of occurred this summer. And I also just want to note that this is the third highest grossing film domestically and internationally from Nolan's career. But this is a wacky and wild movie that was promoted and pushed heavily for IMAX. Ben, let me just hear your thoughts of what Oppenheimer was and is, and why do you think it's the fourth highest grossing film this year? Do we have this summer? Do we have time to talk about this, or am I gonna? <laughs> because I love Oppenheimer, and I'm just gonna say this that uh, I can wait to talk about this movie because we have plenty of times to talk about it, and we may even have a whole episode dedicated to it in our worthy series so i'm very high on the open hype uh i love the movie i think it is a modern masterpiece in many regards i got to see it twice and 70 millimeter imax uh in just it was just beautiful to have that whole experience and i may have just booked another uh showing of it because i want to see this movie over and over again there are so many intricate details in this that is just fascinating to me that can be broken down i think is incredibly smart well thought out tackles the these these ideas that are not just about like is nuclear weapons bad it's about the ego of of people and what that actually does to you and how it can blind you in many ways so i'm very high on oppenheimer and i and just loving the success that it is having whether barbie gave an extra like 500 million or not because that whole hype i don't care because it still deserves this praise and recognition that it's that it is getting i agree that it definitely deserves the praise and recognition that it is getting however um it was just very okay for me i don't know what else i was expecting i did like ben that you said that it kind of delved don't give me that look i like that you said that it delved deeper into people's egos and how that plays um a big role into the you know intricate inner workings of um everything that was going on at this time um 
I don't know. I just, I also just felt like the, you know, the climax scene where, you know, the actual bomb goes off. I was expecting like literally a bigger bang and I was expecting like just a, a greater fireworks show, let's say, um, of that moment because that's just what everything felt like it was leading up to. And then it was just kind of like, oh, okay, that was it. Um, I, I don't know. I just wanted a little bit more from it. I don't know. Uh, it just was, it was okay. It was okay for me. I would definitely I, not. I, I have a lot of counterpoints time. to everything you just said, but I am, that it, as I said, we're going to have probably have a whole episode dedicated to this movie at some point within the history of worthy uh, recordings, episodes, podcasts, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's interesting. You said that. And I don't, I'm in the middle of both of you guys. I think I, I don't think it's a masterpiece. I think it's too long. I think it's a, a little overwritten at times and it, it hurts because I really love Nolan. He's one of my like, favorite directors of all time. I love his films, but I, it, this movie is a lot of thinking for me because I really thought about this for a long time and I'm like, why don't I like this movie that much? Like why, 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 what am I missing? And I'm not missing anything. I think it's just so different in terms of his filmography. Like he takes, he takes these larger than life characters or these larger than life ideas and he breaks them down in a way that's digestible. And not only that, he makes them into like a box office idea, this large film and idea of going into dreams, you know, or reversing time in a way that you can use it as a weapon, you know, and then breaking this down in usually in kind of action style. And if it's not action, it's melodrama done in a way that is action. And, and that is what we have here. It's very melodramatic. It's mainly just characters talking. But instead of being a melodrama focused around a family with like emotion and heart, it's a melodrama about the big psychological question, should we have dropped the bomb? Should we have even made the bomb? And I think it's really interesting and I love the way it kind of dives deep into these characters and represents it in such a real and realistic way. But I just think the movie lacks that central heart, that central reason for me to like care as an actual film. I like really appreciate it as like a depiction of history and this depiction of this insane decision and this sane character and person. But I kept asking myself, like, why do I care about these characters? Like looking at it besides the history, besides everything where is like the emotional center and i think they try to reach for that in terms of his relationship and how that affects his career and how that affects his decision making but i just didn't really buy fully into that and i didn't think that was like an emotional hook enough for me but ben anything else you want to say about oppenheimer before i throw it over to you though i do want to mention that this movie only cost a hundred million dollars so we're seeing it at almost a billion dollars globally. It's insane that it's getting that high. And compare it to every other film so far on this list, even Sound of well, Sound of Freedom being the exception because it's an indie low budget film. It is by far the lowest budget of any other film so far. But Ben, what do you have to say about Oppenheimer? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of like a final point to like say right now about it. And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is is Nolan and I think that it's been such a long career such a great career that has gained a huge following where a fan like you is sitting there wondering why don't I like this compared to the rest of this filmography that I love like how many other filmographies are there where you're like wondering like why don't I like this as much as the others um you know and I think that it's it's the right time it's the right moment in the history of film where people are realize are I think not us, but I think the whole landscape of audiences are realizing, Oh, there's a, there is a difference between filmmaking and making movies, you know, in how it has been in this like digital world. And what Nolan has been doing is like true filmmaking or a callback to filmmaking when at, at its origins. And I think that that, on top of it's a really good story people are wondering like what that whole nuclear bomb sequence is going to be like the whole barbenheimer aspect of it just it, it, it was all the right timing for everything and and also i think that 70 millimeter imax experience where people are saying like go see this in a huge screen helped with it too because those tickets are 
crazy expensive and so i you know we you have to adjust for inflation compared to so many other movies but definitely like this movie is getting a ton of money because of those special showings and how much it costs to go see them yeah i think that's very well said and i think it's a perfect time to transition from the drab and dreary and bomb making to the beautiful colorful skies in the guardians of the galaxy volume three which is our third highest grossing film this summer which of course comes from disney was released on may 5th and has made 358 million dollars this is crazy enough the 23rd film from the mcu and i comparison between the previous films this film worldwide has made 844 million the original guardians of the galaxy has made 773 and volume 2 has made 863 so all things considered with the shifts in in the overall like film going box office that's pretty impressive that it's been able to held and so consistently throughout these three films and i'll go off right off the top i love this movie do i think it's the best guardians of the galaxy i don't i think it might even be the worst but the original is one of my favorite movies of all time i love guardians of the galaxy and these characters and this franchise so much and i think it was a perfect addition and ex- it was a nice exploration into the team and how they operate and why they work so well together and it just kind of makes the previous two films better and i think there's not much else you can say that really honors you know a franchise is making a film that truly increases and overall makes you look back and say wow i like like this franchise even more now than i was expecting you know you can really risk by losing and and failing and making a third film in a franchise like spider-man 3 but here we have something that i think did a really really wonderful job so ben what did you think of the third guardians of the galaxy uh i think the guardians movies have just declined like every time from the first two to the second to the third just I don't know like and I get like why people would love this movie um you know it's personally it wasn't for me I do think it's interesting when we're talking about box office and how much money it made this movie started on May 5th the beginning of the summer calendar uh, you know for movies in the box office so it's had the whole summer uh you know all, you know what May June July and August four months of to get the 350 million which I don't know. Is that strategically planned by Marvel to say like we're gonna release it in May, so it when box office numbers are totaled up, like we should have a top ten hit. And I don't. It, it, this movie just doesn't feel like it should be the third highest grossing movie of the summer, but it is Marvel. You know, it is a part of a huge franchise, and um, there are a lot of people who love Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, the date that it came out, because I honestly forgot that that was even considered a summer movie. Um, It just felt like so long ago. Um, So that definitely plays into the factor of um, its numbers continuing to grow because it's had the longest time to grow. Um, But overall, I did enjoy this movie. I mean, I'm not super into Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, um, but it was fun to see Rocket's backstory maybe i shouldn't use the word fun because it was kind of depressing (laughs) but um it was interesting to see rocket's backstory and um you know get a little more insight into his character um because as someone especially as someone who i i haven't seen all of the mcu um movies it was nice to get a little more insight into him and and um get a little bit more understanding into his character um but overall it was good it was fun but it just um i wouldn't go see it a second time all righty let's move on to the second highest grossing film this summer and that is spider-man across the spider-verse which came out on june 2nd from columbia pictures and has made 381 million dollars ben what did you think about the spider-verse number two i really enjoyed it it was it's a beautifully animated movie uh it's probably gonna win another oscar for animation you know we'll see how what other movies come out uh, towards the end of the year but this movie was incredible and ends on a great cliffhanger um i think some of the issues again with like pacing and timing like it's a for and with uh with mission possible the comparison it's not as long but 
this is a part one of a two part movie. And sometimes you wish that when these part ones and part twos would speed it up to get to, you know, why they wanted to split up in the first place. When, you know, when we're spending so much time, like a two and a half hours with these characters, it feels like it should be its own standalone movie, but they really, you know, they really, you know, flesh it out. They really, you know, elongate the runtime. And I think that is, is good. Cause this movie did, a really good job balancing it, but it wasn't the best balancing job I've seen, but I definitely had a great time watching it. What about you guys? I enjoyed this movie. It was a lot of fun. Um, I really am liking the animated Spider-Man. Um, I just think that they provide a really um, different take on things. It kind of just feels like a graphic novel come to life, and I've been recently getting into graphic novels, so that's been fun lately. Um, I also think that this movie um, is going to do well for kids, like middle school age kids. Um, I used to work with that age group, and they I remember when the last Spider-Man had come out, they went nuts for it. So um, I just think that it's going to do well long term, too, because kids just rewatch these types of movies over and over again. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And really, I think the franchise can be really accredited to Netflix. I think the original film came out. Yes, it did win Best uh, Animated Feature, and I think that obviously did a huge, huge benefit for it. But Netflix is the generator of reviving things, making things bigger than they originally were, and that was the case for the original Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse where it premiered on Netflix. It drove up so many numbers, and everyone kept talking about it, and they're like, whoa, how did I miss this? This was so amazing. And here we are now, years later, where they come out and top themselves. And I don't think it's a better film, but I think in terms of animation, they are certainly topping themselves. It's so incredibly impressive, and I think the numbers speak for themselves because Sony Pictures Animation, this is their highest grossing film of all time. And it's right behind the Smurfs film and Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. So where the franchise goes from here, I think it's really up in the air. We're going to get a third film. It just may be even longer than we had to wait for this because of the strikes, because of the ongoing accusations against uh, some of the, the animators were kind of protesting against how they were treated and just the brutal hours of trying to get this film done in time, which that is a whole side story and, and whole separate kind of conversation. But in regards to the film, I thought it was great. I didn't think it was as solid and, and tight as the original. And I think story wise, it gets a little more wobbly and the whole ending I have an issue with just part one films recently. They've just been bothering me. I think this and Mission Impossible don't really fully feel complete because they almost feel like a TV show that is setting up for the next episode. And I, to me, I just don't think a film should ever feel that way. I think when you look at Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, you watch that and you immediately feel a sense of dread and, and sadness and you're like, oh no, that was crazy and dramatic but it felt like an end it felt like we went through a whole journey and ended the movie with spider-man like yes they they have arcs for some characters but we don't really feel like our journey is over it just feels like we're kind of just cut off and to be continued like it's an episode of batman 66 you know so i don't know i i really love the movie but ending it like that it may just be i have to wait until the third film and this is basically one whole movie for me, like one whole trilogy that maybe people that saw Empire Strikes Back and we're waiting for Return of the Jedi felt like we feel now. Where we're like, God, just, we got to get to the end. Like we got to see what this whole thing is because we're just kind of left on an ending where it's like, where does this go? How, where are we going from here? Like I kind of get what we're setting up, but why couldn't we just wrap it up a little better here? But, Ben, is there anything else to say about Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse? Uh, Spider-Man doesn't really have like a catchphrase, so I'm just going to do the slinging web shots. <laughs> Spider. Pew, 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 <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Finally, our highest grossing film of 2023 summer box office is Barbie. Released by Warner Brothers on July 21st and has made 612 million dollars domestically and a total of 1.3 billion dollars 
Barbie has shattered multiple records, including becoming the top grossing movie in Warner Brothers history after passing the final Harry Potter's picture, Deathly Hallows Part 2. Barbie is even the 13th highest grossing domestic release of all time. And even in terms of adjusted for inflation, it is still the second highest grossing film in Warner Brothers history, right behind The Dark Knight. So, Ben, gosh, what is there to say about Barbie that hasn't been said already? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what hasn't been, like, what we could add. Uh, I think that it's pretty remarkable that Warner Brothers, since 2011, didn't have a one movie that led in the summer box office, but... I guess that's because of the whole Marvel takeover of the last decade plus. Um, so that's kind of fascinating to point that out. But yeah, this movie's great. There, you know, it's it has a, a, a huge heart to it. It has so many funny moments. It's one of the smartest written movies I think I've ever seen. So I, I'm definitely a huge fan. And Ryan Gosling killed it as Ken. Uh, I. You know, I think we can just trade our favorite Ken quotes and, and moments. And one of mine is he just says, well, once I found out the patriarchy wasn't about horses, I kind of just gave up on it. That's amazing. I also loved this movie. Um, it was just funny. Like, I honestly was not expecting it to be funny. I remember bef- prior to it coming out, I kept saying to John, like, what the hell is this movie going to be? Like, the trailers were giving absolutely nothing away. I'm like, what is the story here? I just don't get it. Um, and and I found it to be surprisingly funny. Um, it was visually stunning. It was just so fun to look at. It just kind of transported you um, to kind of what felt like my imagination as a little girl playing with Barbies, like what that world felt like in my brain is what it looked like on screen. So that was really cool to see come to life. Um, I just really like, um, I'm just like, shout out to Greta Gerwig. Um, she just kind of is, is carrying on the momentum of celebrating women. Um, you know, with Lady Bird, I also really enjoyed. And um, it was just a fun watch. It was also really fun because we kind of made it an event. Like John and I dressed up in like all pink. I loved that when we were at the theater, like, everybody else was decked out in pink like head to toe looked like a taylor swift concert like feathers and everything everywhere um so it was just fun that people kind of had a collective moment to come together um come to the theaters the only um i don't even count this as a downside but the only thing is that it felt like i remember saying to john after the movie i'm like if i was like a child i don't think i would understand this movie at all like for all that it's worth um but there are still young girls that are going out repeatedly seeing this movie and enjoying it. So maybe I'm wrong. Um, Maybe if I had, would have had a movie like this growing up as a young girl, you know, it, I, you know, could have impacted me differently than it. Maybe I'm just not seeing right now, but overall loved it. Don't have enough good things to say about it. So what is there to say about this beautiful millennial pink film, man? Barbie is just fantastic. It is way better than I had any hopes of it being. Just like Jackie said, it is so fun and just vibrant. Movies are real again. God damn. Movies are real again. I mean, I think that is such a prominent speaking point for, I think, this film. And yes, there's CGI involved. There's little things that are modern touches of special effects. But there's so much about this film that is real. When you're in the Barbie land, it feels real. When she's sliding down the slide, it is a real slide, you know? We are seeing huge dressed back lots of full pink walls and beautiful skies that are all hand-painted. Like, we are reverting back to techniques that we've been using since the dawn of filmmaking and that we've gotten so far away from, like, integrating back into movies. When you look at this full list of the 10 films here... There is a lot of realness missing. I think you can look at Oppenheimer and see that authenticity that he tries to bring to every film. You can see it. When you see Barbie, you can also see the authenticity. She cares so much about representing what this iconic doll means to culture. And it did such a great job of showing that, like showing it as a cultural thing, not just a cool toy. Like, look what this cool toy can do in a movie 
hopefully you buy this toy. It was like, no, we're going to tell you a story. It's going to be about Barbie, but it's also going to be about girls. It's going to be about mothers. It's going to be about how we as a people have changed because of this thing. For some good, for some bad, you just have to accept it. Like this is a huge thing that impacted society and I didn't really ever think about the Barbie in that way before this movie I just thought about it yeah as like a toy because there's so many random toys so it just inspired me in terms of the way it was made and how funny it could be all while being so just notable and how it's hitting these very topical issues and how it, it added really decent conversations to what people talk about and argue on social media every day the difference between a matriarchy and a patriarchy, the difference between how men and women just simply interact day to day. And it still somehow had a voice that felt unique. So I think this movie is just deserves all of its credit, how it's made this much money. I mean, we're almost looking at double how much Spider-Man made. So this is not just a, Oh, this movie made a lot of money this year. This is like truly something special and unique for the box office and i hope it's not the last of its kind when it comes to real filmmaking that shows real numbers like this but man i had a great time at barbie i hope it never gets sequels and there's no (laughs) ken movie if there's any of the crazy mattel stories that we're hearing about all the toy films they're gonna make yeah but only time will tell yeah well we'll see what happens you know i just want to you know talk about old filmmaking yeah, this movie does a great job of, of using old techniques uh, for how you know the sets are constructed, how people are interacting within the world, and also tropes. And I think, you know, not that the ideas of the patriarchy, you know, being this, you know, this thing that has like hampered women for centuries for all of humanity and, and mankind. Uh, it's just like we 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 know that, but what it does is that it satires it it pokes fun at it in a very accessible way. And, and when it, we think about old movies and old tropes, one of the things that really stood out to me was the role reversals where, you know, Ken is this, you know, the scorn lover female figure where, you know, they enact revenge as Barbie, who's taking this like male role, like finding themselves in the world and what they can become. And I just found it to be like, just so smart and actually, and it's such a small part of it. But America Ferrer's character, you know, she's the person that steps into the outsided, you know, person that comes in as the hero, as this like B plot character that has a lot of like uh, impact on the movie. You know, her husband you never see, and it's like that in many old movies where the man swoops in and he's like helping them out, our main hero, and and making sure that their goal is accomplished, and their significant other is just like oh hey there hi there in the distance and like doesn't really matter and they're still like insignificant and it's like that kind of small detailing of in the movie where america Ferrer's husband is that character and how it's treated i thought it was just like so smart so this movie from old movie tropes and how it role reversals and using old techniques and new ways to talk about specific discussions is so was just so smart and well thought out yeah, I think that's that's really well said. And I think this perfectly segues us into some of the biggest stories this summer. And so prominently, if you really wanted to look at besides the Hollywood strikes, which, you know, what else can we say? Everyone's losing money. Sucks. Warner Brothers is bleeding money. Sucks. <laughs> it sucks that we're not, you know, making content and people are losing their jobs. It sucks. And we hope it ends as soon as possible and everyone gets the deal that they wanted. But let's talk about Barbenheimer. Like what is Barbenheimer? How did this happen? I remember seeing it so early on when people just saw the first kind of promotional images from both. They kind of connected with people that they're on the same weekend and it was very much film Reddit. It was very much film Twitter. It was these communities that you see people always making funny memes about upcoming movies or poking fun at studios or franchises. And then something changed where, People at work were talking about it. People on the news were talking about it. And it just changed so much that it became this cultural phenomenon that it got people so excited. Like Jackie said, people were getting dressed up for both of these movies, for Barbie and also wearing like full suits and hats for Oppenheimer. Some very odd behavior, but I love it because people are going to the movies. They're excited to go and they're excited to see these movies that feel like 
they need to see. They don't want to be the last person to see it. it. It's that sitting around the water cooler and talking about these films and you want to be a part of the conversation. Oh, did you see Oppenheimer? Like how crazy was that bomb scene or how crazy was it seeing Killian Murphy's dick? It was wild. Or you go and see Barbie and, and you're just like, oh my God, like wasn't that speech by America Ferrer like incredible? Like didn't you relate to that so much? And it just causes everyone to talk about movies and gosh darn do I love that obviously we need more of that and I think it's a beautiful thing that we got this Barbenheimer but I'm curious what do you guys think of Barbenheimer how did this happen and do you think this can ever happen again Ben I uh, I think that to answer that question of like can this ever happen again I think would is a lot of people maybe trying too hard to make a Barbenheimer happen and I think that it's just like I got just a happy coincidence that both these movies were coming out and that it created this groundswell. One of the things that I was very fearful of when the whole Barbenheimer thing was like starting to trend and become a thing was, is this going to be another minions thing where people are going to the movies and just being just dicks and, and just like not being respectful and yeah, they're dressing up, but they're coming out in these droves and just like, like mocking like the, being an audience at a movie theater and like making making a meme of it and i was fearful that like that would happen with these movies that people would would just be like awful audience members and uh you know one of my pet peeves of living in a big city and going to movies with huge crowds is sometimes there are just so many inconsiderate people in theaters and it's mind-boggling to me that people can't just sit there for two hours and just like shut the fuck up (laughs) um but Anyways, uh, yeah, so I, you know, in terms of, like, where it was starting, it was, like, okay, this is, like, just a weird, like, meme, but then when the weekend happened, it was, like, all over the place. Everybody that you knew was posting about doing some form of a Barbenheimer experience, and I saw Barbie first before Barbenheimer. I didn't do it on the same day, but I did it on back-to-back days, and I think that was, like, for me, that was a great way to do it because it allowed, like, the first movie to sink in and let me like really think about it and then Oppenheimer it had its own day where I could sit there and think about that so um you know how did you guys enjoy your Barbenheimer experiences any like fun tidbits about it I think that this might be the secret to kind of saving the movie industry kind of making things more eventized um because I can't even think of the last time that You know, people who don't go to the movies were actually excited to go to the movies and were talking about it and spreading the word. Um, But Barbara and Harvey was fun. We, like I said, we dressed up in all pink. The theater that we went to, we just so happened, like when we pulled up, there was a giant pink stretch limo in front of the theater so people were definitely using that as an opportunity to take their barbie pics in front of we definitely got a photo in front of it which made it a lot of fun too kind of looked like we rented it out um but yeah i think that this might be an idea for future like marketing purposes like how can we like almost eventize and um make people excited to get into the theaters again Another weird story that came about this summer fairly recently was involving the artist Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift recently had this huge eras tour where she went through multiple albums of hers and broke so many records and being such a popular tour and it has made so, so, so much money. And to make more money on top of this, she's going and making a concert film. And this was in a concert film that has been skipped over by studios. It's not manufactured or made in deal or partnership with a studio. It is done by her and I'm assuming her production team and then gone out and just went skipped right over that part portion of filmmaking and went right to the theater. So she is in in an insane position where she's made an insane deal. So let me give you some backstory here. The Taylor Swift The Eras concert will play from October 13th to the 15th and then again on the 19th, 22nd to the 26th, 29th and 31st and then again in November 2nd to the 5th. And it's going to be playing at multiple theaters even in IMAX with the ticketing pricing of 19.89 weirdly enough and 13.13 if you are a child I believe and Citing sources report that SMC CEO Adam Aaron personally negotiated the deal directly with Swift's uh, 
parents, Scott and Andrea Swift, over several weeks. Among the agreed-upon terms is the 43% of the gross will remain with theaters, while the remaining 57% will be shared by Swift and AMC. This is extremely important in regards to film distribution as this directly oversteps studios and production companies. So I wanted to point out that this is so odd. This is bizarre. Her pricing of this at 1989 is very specific in reference to her 1989 album. I think it's the year she was born or something along those lines. But Another thing about this is that you can't refund these tickets. So you can buy all these tickets, which it immediately sold out in all of the theaters that it was available in because she has such a huge fan base and you can't refund them. You can't sell them, I'm assuming. You're just forever associated with that ticket. And I'm assuming that's to prevent scalping and, and resellers or scams. But it's, it's crazy. That's not something you do. You can immediately refund your tickets when you buy it in Regal or AMC and they'll get your money back really quickly. So pretty insane that that's happening. She's making 57% of all this money. She's charging more than a standard ticket. So all of this money is going directly into her pocket, basically. She's going to make a, an insane amount of money off of this. It makes you ask the question of like, well, if you're a big director, could you do this and skip over studios? Can you yourself be the portion of the studio and kind of go beyond maybe like Coppola and, and Lucas were trying to do back in the 70s? And the final crazy aspect of this whole story is that this film was so popular, it came out of nowhere, the announcement, and it caused three films that were supposed to come out around the same time to leave. You have the new Exorcist movie by Blumhouse called Exorcist Believer. What Happened After and Be the Light, three films completely moved and changed their release date because they were so afraid of how popular these screenings were going to be. So, all that being said, Ben, is this a crazy deal or am I losing my mind here? Um, I think, th I, you know, I hate to say you're losing your mind, but I think that you're probably underselling how much money and how much influence Taylor Swift has like she is probably worth herself has to be well over five hundred million dollars. So how many directors and filmmakers do you know that have at least half a bill just sitting in the bank account and able to finance a movie like like what she's doing and having full creative control? Like of course she doesn't need a studio to back her. She can do it all herself. She can hire one editor to put it into a premiere and just like there's the movie. Like there it's not like she's doing anything that's like crazy complicated. So the cost of it is also paid for by the tour itself. And the, you know, I don't know how I end up like, I have not seen the tour, but I have like enough like shit being thrown at me on social media to like know what's going on. And th this tour, like the tickets are hundreds, if not thousands of dollars that people are paying and selling out stadiums multiple nights so she is getting so much money that like doing something like this is nothing to her in the long run this is just like it's just like money to like she can easily make like this is an incredibly smart move by her she's capitalizing at the right time and for the people that aren't going to the concerts they get to go see it in the movie theaters and probably have a better chance of getting to see her that way and of course that like pricing of 1989 and 1313 which are like references to her and her music and just her whole like iconography of who taylor swift is of course little girls who are dressing up and wearing all these like different like friendship bracelets and different eras are dressing and taylor swift things so it's like so like it doesn't phase me that any of this is happening in terms of like money and reach and, and how well it's doing Jackie hates Taylor Swift, so we're going to move on <laughs> and pass her just like Jackie would if she was walking by her on the street. Let's. I'm going to ask you guys some questions here to wrap up our top summer films. And first and foremost, what was the biggest surprise you saw this summer? Maybe it was something you weren't expecting. Maybe it was a film that you had no idea you were going to. Maybe it was a Monday mystery night movie. Ben, what was the biggest surprise this summer? You know, this is kind of like hard for me to like figure out like what was the surprise for me. And uh, I went with no hard feelings. I was surprised by how much heart was in that movie. It had a true emotional core that I don't think I was expecting. And I kind of 
felt that the movie was just going to be kind of a goof fest and that it's just like a comedy movie that they're trying to put together but they're like no this movie had like a lot of like heart and a lot of emotions to like say it's not the best movie but i was very surprised by how i walked away from this movie and how i was feeling um the biggest surprise for me was talk to me um i went in totally blind and i left extremely scared and extremely pleased with how well i thought the movie was um it just felt like a really fresh um take on a horror movie it was legitimately scary and um i really was not expecting it i think that it was um, a nice surprise and I think that if people are getting ready for spooky season because it's almost a time they should I was really surprised by Joyride I mean it looked so ridiculous it looked like Hangover meets Bridesmaids Bridesmaids. yes thank you that's a perfect comparison it but it just looked crazy and it looked like something I probably already seen before but no other film this summer has made me cry from laughing so hard and actually made me cry because I was so emotionally touched by it. I was shocked by this story of, you know, someone who was adopted and brought to America and didn't know her birth mother. And she wanted to go on this expedition to kind of change that aspect of her life and finally meet her mother. And it was a very touching story that I was not expecting. When you watch the trailer and you see a girl trying to like get drugs out of her butt and she's pooping on the side of the road it's like you don't expect to cry at that movie i'm sorry that was just very unexpected and it surprised me and i just had a great time it was quick you were in and out it was fun it was constantly moving it was like a freight train and it was just a blast i had a a great time jack and i laughed our asses off that whole time So moving on, I want to talk about the biggest disappointment of the summer. Ben, what was the movie that just completely let you down? Sorry, Jackie. Um, I call Talk to Me, Talk to Meh. I thought that movie was so mid-tier in many of its aspects. I was hyped to go see it because I was hearing all these like wonderful, good, great things about it. I saw that the numbers were doing well at the box office for an A24 movie. I was like, okay, like great. Like I love A24 really in a horror and yeah there are like the spooky jump scary moments in it but i really loathed the main character she was like in it and the movie tries really hard to make you invest in this emotional core in the movie so i feel like when people are you know you think of horror you're you know, it's easy just to push away the like non-horror bits of it to just like the goofy just like when they're just regular people type of thing like this movie tried to use that part to make it successful in the movie and i hated that main character and all the choices she made and there was really no redeeming quality about her so it just like made this whole like you know this adventure for you know to battle this monster to kind of like not feel like worth it to me and i kind of knew how the movie was ending and i didn't feel it was fresh i actually thought this movie ripped off smile from like last year with like this monster or being something you can't really see that's supernatural and the battle is more within yourself and trying to get through it you get like little glimpses of like maybe what it is or maybe what's going on and i just felt that that has been done already so it wasn't like anything new or groundbreaking and then anything they tried to do to like ramp it up with the emotional core just didn't do it for me so it's just like such a huge letdown when i was walking out of the movie and I, that's why i call it talk to me <laughs> talk to me um that's fair i think that i i, I can understand what you're saying with the lacking kind of central character but i don't think at no point in time did I see where the movie was going and I feel like when that happens I'm usually disappointed by the ending of the movie but I was pleasantly surprised but I guess everyone will have to see for themselves um my biggest disappointment was the little mermaid um I kind of touched on this a little bit but I just feel like it's 2023 we need to do better if we're going to be remaking movies that are that old and I don't want to see the same story over and over again I want something new I want something fresh and something that you know does a little more justice to its 
female leads. My biggest disappointment was so sad. And that's because it was Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. Ah, uh, man. I love Wes Anderson. I love almost all of his movies. I think I love maybe every one of his movies. Maybe I need to go watch this movie again. Maybe I need to watch it three times. I was just so frustrated during this film because it was not at all what I was hoping it would be, which is similar to the rest of his films. You know, you take this like very specific interest or this spe very specific world to this family or this kid in school and these very different aspects or a fox maybe out in, in the woods trying to protect his family. And you have this like super emotional tale that shows you how they go on this roller coaster of this crazy moment in time in their life. And this was this introspective meta idea of storytelling. And it was just something I really wasn't expecting at all from him. It was way more introspective. And it just was really interested in the idea of like telling stories or characters within a character. And I just was not about that. And I usually love meta filmmaking and things that go beyond that f the third wall. But there was something about this that just rub me the wrong way and it may be that I come back to it later in time and I find a better appreciation for it knowing that that's what the film is but I think I maybe just need some time because I, I was so excited I mean this fun crazy western world and it's the style of like the space era of the 60s mixed in with a western town like oh my god it was like a dream come true and the movie of course is beautiful to look at it's shot so well and the production design is incredible I just lacked the the connection again. I just was like, what is this movie? Why are we following this play that's a movie that's not a movie? It's just like, come on. Can I just see a movie? Like, I would like to yeah. just see a movie by U.S. Anderson. So it was frustrating. Yeah, this movie, I you know, I, I didn't want to repeat for biggest disappointment because this was a huge disappointment for me. I was so hyped up for Asteroid City. And, yeah, I just felt the actual story itself wasn't enough to match the visuals and i think again like the trailer made it look so good it showed it showed all the cool visual parts so there was something like left to intrigue maybe besides jeff goldblum's character which great just great cameo and moment in the movie but it's a huge disappointment when compared to the run that wes anderson was on all righty let's move on to your favorite film of the summer and I'll go for myself really quickly here. I already talked about it. That pink, beautiful film called Barbie. What else does there to be said? I loved it. Made me laugh. I got choked up. It was beautiful. Margot Robbie deserves all the money, all the recognition. Gosh dang her <laughs> for her beautiful looks and brains. Ben, what is your favorite film of the summer? Uh, it's Oppenheimer. It's my favorite movie of the year. Uh, and I think it's going to just do great things in the months to come. So favorite film, Oppenheimer. Mine is Joyride. I really enjoyed it. Made me laugh, made me cry. It's everything I wanted in a movie. Um, and I really thought all of the main women did a really great job. All righty. We're getting close to the end, but I want to know about any other thoughts or opinions on any of the other films. I will go quickly Fuck the haters. The Flash was awesome. I've seen it like three times now. It rocks. I don't care what anyone else says. That movie is an awesome time. I don't care what Ben says. Talk to me was dope. It's my favorite horror movie of the year. It's way better than Smile. It's kick ass. I love the main character. She was conflicted and you didn't know whether to root for her. And goddamn, that was such a sick ending to that movie. Uh, what else? Fool's Paradise. Man, that movie sucks. <laughs> uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, incredible animation, so good. Bottoms, thank you, Ben, for telling me to go see that movie because it was the most ridiculous movie I've maybe seen so in like absurd. five years. So maybe absurd. since like Step Brothers, the most absurd movie I've ever seen. Um, but any other films that you want to chat about a little bit here? Uh, just looking at this list real quick, the one movie that really jumps out and would not seem like the summer blockbuster but had – some traction early on in the summer calendar was past lives. Um, it's a beautiful little movie. And I think that more people should go out and see it. It, it, it just has it, man, it's such a well-told story. It's just this just little 
snippet of life that has so much to do with life itself, but it's just so centered on these three people. It's a beautiful movie. All righty. And then looking forward to the future, thinking about this fall, while so many movies have been delayed, like Dune or the Godzilla King Kong movie got pushed back. I don't even think that was coming this fall, but even a lot of just, films coming this fall just got Dune, pushed just out. Just Dune being pushed back is... It, my heart <laughs> breaks. I saw a poster the other night yeah. that had Dune and then November 3rd on it, and I just wanted to rip it down. Could, <laughs> cannot take a look at it. You should. I mean, that may be valuable. Like, well, it, that's it was probably going to be in a like case, an artifact. It was in a, in a case at the movie theater and like the poster thing. I didn't, you know, I'm not trying to get kicked out. No, you should have broken and stole I'm it. not trying to get kicked out of my yeah, movie theater. So. I can't wait for a lot of the films that are coming. I'm looking at like Dumb Money, The Creator, coming out this month in september already i'm definitely going to go see saw x seen every single one and then obviously we have looking forward to the killers of the flower moon by scorsese i mean come on can't wait for that a fincher film that doesn't happen very often with the killer that's so exciting i know we're both going to try to see exorcist believer we know that for sure and jackie i think there's a movie here in october that you might be excited about yeah i can't wait to see priscilla um a couple months ago maybe like a year ago at this point john got me priscilla's autobiography that was published in 1986 and i read through it and it had a lot of juicy details about her and her relationship with elvis i'm a big elvis fan and um, I'm just shocked now that this is going to be made into a movie. And I'm very excited about it. And I'm excited about the casting, too. So that's going to be a fun watch. What about you, Ben? What are you excited about coming this fall and winter? Oh, man, just this fall and winter. I mean, I'm very excited for the creator. I uh, saw X because obviously the Saw movies are just the fun, fun time. Uh, Haunting in Venice, I'm looking forward to. Uh, obviously, Scorsese's Kills of the Flower Moon. The Killer, looking forward to that. Priscilla, very interested to see that, especially because of Elvis coming out last year. Like, again, like I, my cynical side of me is like, did they just think that, oh, Elvis came out, let's make this Priscilla movie now? Uh, so that's kind of interesting to me. I'm, you know, Napoleon will be, I think, a fascinating watch. Uh, Next Goal Wins is another one that I'm looking forward to uh, in November. Um, and then when we get into December, uh, you know, there that's when like the Oscar season movies will be coming out, and that's when. You have to keep your eyes on the on the ground and like know what's getting popular, what's not, what's getting the good reviews, what isn't. So there's just too much out there in those months that you have to just keep track and just see what happens, see how the season falls out. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And I, while a lot of films got kicked out, I think there's still a lot to look forward to. Even Ferrari, we have Mr. Man coming back to theaters again. Wonka, I mean, that may be a train wreck, but I'm going to be there for that. It's going to be fun. That movie's either going to bomb horrifically or it's going to be like the biggest movie of this fall winter. Yeah, those Kylie Jenner fans are really going to help. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's free promo. Honestly, is that tied into Wonka promotion? Could be. Could be. Honestly, <laughs> could be. <laughs> and there's no way that we can end a worthy podcast without talking about the Oscars. So I want to ask both you, my fiance Jacqueline, and Mr. Benjamin, what is going to win Best Picture? Well, I've kind of, you know, shot my load, I think, earlier in this movie, but it's Oppenheimer. I think Oppenheimer... Don't shoot your load, Ben. <laughs> I was going to start over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I kind of, you know, shot all the bullets out of my gun before in Oppenheimer. Uh, I'm very, very excited about, like, I like to say that I'm excited about this movie is if it didn't come out. Like, I'm just excited with everything surrounding this movie. And I do think it's going to win Best Picture. I think it's going to have a huge night at the Oscars. I think, and especially because Dune is not coming out this year, you know, I think everyone's like, anticipating what, Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be because that might be the the only real competition. Barbie, I you know I would love to see it in the Best Picture race, but I think there's going to be a lot of naysayers still and not and potentially not put it in the Best Picture nominations. I don't think that will happen, but I could definitely see a, a world where that does happen. So it would be interested to see how that all falls out. But I just think Oppenheimer, that's going to win Best Picture. Lock it in. I. 
think that you may be right. However, I would love to see Barbie pull through um, and win. This just is not, you know, your typical looking best picture movie. Um, but either way, I definitely think that Margot Robbie would definitely be up there for a best actress nomination. Um, and I really, I do think that Dune would have been a good contender had it been coming out this year. Um, but other than Oppenheimer, I don't see too many strong contenders to take that away upcoming from this year. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's not crazy. I think after the performance that we've seen and how much it's really blown up in everyone's eyes, it, it, it's going to be talked about when it comes to Oscar season. But I'm with you, Ben. I do think it's going to be Oppenheimer. This is just no one's year. I think it's finally time. Dune's pushed out of the way. I think you could maybe look at like Ava DuVernay with Origins. That's looking extremely interesting. We'll see how good Ferrari is or the Color Purple musical is. But it just feels right. Everyone seems to really love this movie as critical. It's been critically acclaimed. It has made so much money. People love it. You know, there's not many things that people say even negatively about it at all. And I think the conversation is going to continue and carry on until our Oscars season. And I don't have a problem with that. No one deserves this. I'm glad this is happening. And I hope we're right. And I hope he does win. And I hope it takes home a bunch of awards, even though it didn't click with me that much personally. I still think it is a wonderful film, and it's very, very, very well made. And I understand why people think it's one of his best films, but it's just not mine. Yeah. And that's not a problem. That's not a problem at all. No, it's definitely not. I mean, just to give maybe a really bold prediction, just like top of my head, I think Oppenheimer can win seven Oscars. I think it can win up to seven, but I actually think – it could be nine. I think that this movie has a lot of potential in the technical categories for I'm gonna, picture, director, actor, uh, cinematography, sound, and then editing. So that's, um, oh, sure, that's six locked in. So then maybe the seventh and eighth to Robert Downey Jr. Maybe Emily Blunt, that weird supporting actress thing does happen, but I don't think it won't. I think script, potentially, it could get. And then... It's just going to sound kind of kooky, but the visual effects of the movie and all being practical, little to no CGI used, I think will weigh kind of heavily and people kind of will maybe react to the whole, you know, digital movement, the how, you know, visual effects movies that have won. Like, I think it could be very surprising with the amount of Oscars that this movie could walk away with because Dune is not going to get released. Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. I'm man it would be crazy if it really does sweep to that degree i think there's still going to be some other heavy hitters it's so it's we're always going to look back and be like what if with dune you know what if dune came out like how much would have changed what would have oppenheimer swept maybe it doesn't sweep who knows but i want to thank you guys for listening and checking out worthy check out worthy on youtube instagram at worthy podcast subscribe to our patreon we have a patreon now if you haven't heard and, you know, nothing's changing about our content. You're going to get the same amount of content. It's always going to be free here at Worthy. We believe in it. Believe in that free, sweet content, <laughs> baby. But I want to thank you all. I'm John. I'm Ben. And I'm Jackie. And, and this, is, this worthy. is Worthy. Thanks for listening to Worthy, the breakdown of every Best Picture winner from past to present. You can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on Instagram at Worthy Podcast, on Twitter at WorthyPod, and on Facebook at Worthy Podcast.